This is Duke University. John chapter 20, verse 18. And Mary went to the disciples with this news. I have seen the Lord. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. It is my prayer today that you will open the eyes of the blind, Lord. Set at liberty those who are captives. Set free the oppressed. Comfort the afflicted. And if there are any of us in here who have become too comfortable, I pray is that you will afflict us in the name of Jesus. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. You may please be seated. The Gospel of John presents us with one of the most sophisticated epistemologies in all of scripture. This gospel confronts the reader with a complex system of metaphors that are not so easy to explain. Epistemology in this gospel cannot be detached from Christology, and yet the identity of Jesus remains a mystery to most, especially those who are outside the sheepfold the community of the elect. Jesus says in John 10 that the shepherd knows the sheep and the sheep hear the shepherd's voice. In verse 11 of John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They listen to my voice. Um, the, those who belong to the sheepfold know the shepherd's voice, but to those outside the sheepfold, Jesus' identity remains a mystery. As Wayne Meeks has shown, the ascent and descent motif that recurs in this gospel is a cipher for the hiddenness of Jesus' identity from those outside the community of the elect. In this respect, John chapter 6 is quite telling. For in this discourse, for this discourse about the bread of heaven reveals that understanding Jesus' identity is inextricably bound to discipleship in this gospel. When Jesus teaches about the bread that comes from heaven, John 60 verse 60 tells us that many of the disciples began to murmur and say to themselves, what teaching is this? This is, this is hard, this is a hard saying. It is, who can hear this message? And Jesus, discerning that they are murmuring this amongst themselves, say to them, are you offended at this? What if you see the Son of Man ascending um, um, where, he, where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh, the flesh profits nothing. What the words I have spoken to you are flesh, uh, are spirit, and life. At his teaching, many of the disciples, according to John chapter 6, verse 66, desert Jesus. They leave him and no longer go, go with him. And Jesus says to his disciples, are you going also? And Peter says, to whom shall we go? Lord, you have the words of life. The, um, um, staying with Jesus and remaining with Jesus is part of discipleship in this gospel. Those who do not understand Jesus' identity abandon him. They desert him. But those who seek to understand his identity remain with him. As a number of scholars have noted, remaining and abiding with Jesus is crucial for understanding discipleship in this gospel. Physical proximity to Jesus is crucial 
to, to discipleship. For just as Jesus abides in the Father, John chapter 15, so also those his disciples abide in and with him. In this regard, then, the women in this, gospels are present, in this gospel are presented as paragons of discipleship. When the disciples abandoned Jesus at his crucifixion, the women remain at the cross, John chapter 19, verse 25. It is in this light that Mary Magdalene must be understood. Mary, just as the women, quote, stood at the cross, Mary stood at the tomb. And when Mary discovers the empty tomb, she goes and gets Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. And as the text tells us, that Peter and the disciple come, and when they discover the empty tomb, they return back to their homes. But Mary remains. She abides at the tomb. Mary represents faithful discipleship. Today's reading then presents us with a conundrum. If it is the case that the shepherd knows his sheep and that the sheep know the shepherd and listen and recognize his voice, then it is quite puzzling to say the least that this paragon of discipleship, Mary Magdalene, hears Jesus' voice at the tomb and mistakes him for a gardener. As John tells us, Mary says to this stranger, Sir, thinking that he was a gardener, he says to him, he was the gardener, he says to him, Sir, if you have taken him, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him so I can go get him. Jesus' sheep failed to recognize his voice. How is it that those who are supposed to know the shepherd fail to recognize his voice in times of crisis? How is it that this paragon of discipleship fails to discern the voice of Jesus? Perhaps, perhaps, it may have been because Mary was weeping. Twice the text tells us that Mary has asked this poignant question. Woman, why are you weeping? First, she's asked this question by the two strange figures, two mysterious figures in the tomb, and then by um, mistaken gardener Jesus. Twice, Mary has asked the question, woman, why are you weeping? But note the setting of this question. Mary has asked this question at a cemetery. What an insensitive question. I mean, what, what other conduct is more fitting for a cemetery? Woman, why are you weeping? Life does present us with our own cemeteries, those places of death and hopelessness those places of deep hurt and pain, those places of agony and despair, those places where all we can do is weep. Woman, why are you weeping? What a strange question in a strange place to someone in a strange state of mind. But that Mary is asked this question twice suggests that this question is crucial for grasping the resurrection. It suggests that we, we will fail to grasp the resurrection, we will fail to comprehend the resurrection unless we come to grips with the fact that God elected to announce this news of great joy and glad tidings first at a cemetery. Thus, to be a people of the resurrection is to daily register the challenge of living under the cloud of the question, child of God, why are you weeping? In the midst of our weeping at our own cemeteries, 
To be a people of the resurrection is to ensure that our weeping does not drown out the voice of the one who speaks to us at our cemeteries. Mary may have been so absorbed in her weeping that she failed to recognize Jesus. But it's also possible that Mary fails to recognize Jesus because she was looking in the wrong direction. The text tells us in verse 16 of John 20 that when God, Jesus calls Mary's name, Mary turns towards Jesus. Now, mind you, in verse 14, we are told that Mary turns around in verse 14, perhaps because of the frustrating discussion she was having with these two strange figures in the tomb who didn't seem to have a clue as to what she was asking of them. Mary turns around in verse 14, and she catches a glimpse of Jesus. But it may have been a quick glance because she misses him. Crucially, in verse 16, we are told that Mary turns around again. And this may suggest that in her anguish, Mary had turned back to fixing her gaze upon the tomb. Mary was facing the sepulcher. One of the most frustrating driving experiences for me is trying to make a right turn at a red light. When I get to a red light and I'm eager to make a right turn, I turn my attention to uh, traffic coming from the left side. Uh, and I try to calculate how fast they're coming, not just how fast they're coming, I want to see what lanes they are in, in hopes that I could steal a lane myself. Uh, so as I stand there and keep my eyes on that incoming traffic from my left, eventually my red light turns green. But I don't see it because I am looking at that traffic coming from my left side until some people start honking at me. There are some really crazy people out there, so be careful. <laughs> I like to think, I don't like to democratize my experience, but I have this funny feeling that I'm not the only one who, who gets to a red light and, and, and tries to make a right turn and misses his own green light. So I can even say that often in life, we miss our green lights because we are looking in the wrong direction. Mary had ten, turned back to facing the sepulcher. The sepulcher, that place of death's victory and shattered dreams, the sepulcher, the play, the site of buried relationships, utter degradation and pervasive disintegration, the sepulcher, the place of great anxiety and deep uncertainty, the sepulcher, the place where all hope is vanquished and all seems lost. Mary had to turn away from the sepulchre towards Jesus. And she turns towards Jesus, and she discovers that the one who had been speaking to her all along at the cemetery was no mere gardener. She returns to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. When we turn from the sepulchre toward Jesus, we discover that the one who has been standing with us and speaking to us at our own cemeteries is no mere human. He is the Lord. God raised him from the dead. He's alive. He's alive. And because God raised him from the dead, God has crowned him ruler of the universe. King of kings and Lord of laws. He is head over all powers, authorities, and principalities. He is the giver and sustainer of life. It is the Lord who stands with us at our own cemeteries. Glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs>